You cannot imagine how joyful we are being back playing live music together after 20 months of silence. What a relief that has, it is for all of us. And back in Symphony Hall, the greatest concert hall for this music in the world. On this very day in 1900, Symphony Hall opened for the first time. So it is a birthday today, which we're celebrating. And playing Bruckner of all things, a pinnacle work of the repertoire, a work almost never played. Do you know that the last time the Boston Symphony played this work in this hall was 25 years ago? And the time before that, 40 years. Most extraordinary. What a rush it is for us to be here and to play. We have played it before, but never here. And this is like playing in Mecca. This is the home for this music. So we're th totally thrilled. Now, a few weeks ago, I went on a trip to the Cape uh, to present at an event, and I got talking with the limousine driver. And the subject got to Bruckner, as it does, and, um, <laughs> and I started telling about this symphony and how excited I was. And I started telling him about what happens in it. And he got more and more excited. And my voice got more energized and more. Ex and finally, he said, could I come? And I said, absolutely, you can come. Well, he's here. I'm happy to say he's sitting here with his wife. He called his, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he called his wife, Meg, from the car in order to say, we're going to Symphony Hall. And they're going to sit up in the balcony, because that's the place to be. And the interesting thing is that he's never been here. And he's also never heard a classical concert. This is the first time. And imagine hearing Bruckner 8 is the first thing you ever hear. Unbelievable. And then there was Kate, our horn player, third horn. Kate uh, is in a dog walking group with 20 other dog owners. And they're all coming tonight. And most of them have never been to a concert either. And then there's one of our cellists who's bringing 50 people. She used to work for the Obama administration in the last administration. And she's back in town and she's bringing 50 people. And I get tested for COVID twice a week. And all the people who've been to my house testing me, they're all coming, right? And none of them have ever, Bruckner, who's that? <laughs> right. So this is an interesting situation because Bruckner is not usually thought of as a good introduction to classical music. Well, he lived in almost complete obscurity in an upper Austrian village. He was an elementary school teacher, and he played the organ in the village uh, church, and he composed symphonies. And it went on for a while, and then his seventh symphony was performed for the first time. And he was actually conducted by Arthur Nikisch. Now, Arthur Nikisch, my father played under Arthur Nikisch, so there's a connection here to Nikisch. But the, the event that was really extraordinary was the second concert, the second time it was performed under a conductor called Hermann Levy in Munich. And it was a huge success. And suddenly, overnight, this obscure, unknown, modest, elementary school teacher became a great composer and talked ev about everywhere. Imagine what happened to his life. All his life he'd waited for this moment to be accepted as a great symphonist. And so he settled down to write the Eighth Symphony. And he sent that to that very conductor who had conducted the performance of the Seventh, Hermann Levy, his hero. And he thought, that was the way he would take it on. And the result was the opposite. Levy said, no, sorry, it's no good. Don't like it. Moreover, I don't understand it. And so he refused it. 
It was rejected and it was devastating for Bruckner, absolutely devastating. He was tormented by that. And in those days, his music was very, caused much consternation amongst even great musicians. Hans von Bühler, one of the greatest conductors in the world at that time, referred to the symphonies of Bruckner as the anti-musical ravings of a half-wit. Imagine that. And Brahms, who should have known better, referred to them as symphonic boa constrictors, a swindle soon to be forgotten. How wrong they were. But even today, many, many musicians and music lovers have found Bruckner's music either unacceptable or difficult, or, and they reject it. So how can I entice you? Well, you're here, which is great. <laughs> Thank you for that. You must have either got to know the music or found somebody to tell you something that you trusted that brought you here. And I'm very, very grateful for that. But you do need a key for this music. You've heard it's very long, and some of you have heard that it's boring. I will tell you that it is a workout. It is hard work. Actually, it's a work in since it goes on in your head. It's like going to a gymnasium for the soul, if you can imagine that. One thing I will tell you immediately, which should make you feel very calm, and I'm talking mainly to Dennis and others like him, the music is beautiful from beginning to end. It's all very, very beautiful and rich, and there's something interesting at every single moment. And so you should have a good time just for that reason. But what did I say to Dennis that brought him to this level of excitement and commitment so that he would leave his children at home and come with his wife? Well, I talked about this hall. I talked about the uncanny acoustics of this hall. I told him that John Allen, one of the famous acousticians in the world, who's been responsible for building a lot of modern halls, has flown from Las Vegas to be here tonight because he says this space is the most perfect space for the music of Bruckner that exists anywhere in the world. And he could explain that to you, but we don't have time for that, for him to explain the te technology of it. But the sound comes from the stage and billows out over the whole hall until when it reaches the last row of the second balcony, it reaches its full bloom. And it's one of the most beautiful things you can experience. So that's what I talked about. I told. Uh, this wonderful man who incidentally he may not have been here and he may not have heard classical music But he is a passionate musician. He loves fish That's a pop group <laughs> He's been to hundred and fifty pop uh, fish concerts, so he's absolutely ready for this event <laughs> all right so he's in a he's in a perfect space for music and particularly for this music, for the clarity, for the rich, pure, glorious sound. There is not a bad seat anywhere in this hall. And so that the, the sound in here will be intoxicating. And for people who are playing here, there's nowhere else like it. One of the great conductors uh, Esa Pekka Solonen, who's conducted all over the world, said that when he stood on the stage to conduct the Boston Symphony for the first time, he almost stopped conducting because he couldn't believe the sound. So just that alone. But I tell you what else we talked about. We talked about the sound of Bruckner. Oh my God, the sound of Bruckner, just the sheer sound of what uh, comes out of this. There's a passage in the third movement. Uh, in which four Wagner tubers, they're instruments invented by Wagner, tall instruments with a bell like that, and they make a glorious, magnificent sound. And if you add a tuba in the bass, a bass tuba, you get this extraordinary sound. hear that sound coming from the back of the stage, 
Oh, it's just the most beautiful thing you could. It's sheer glory. And then comes, after that, the whole orchestra playing all together in C major. Well, of course, he doesn't know C major, but that doesn't matter. It's just going, going from E major to C major like that. Oh, it's just an overwhelming sound. And it sounds like an organ, and in fact, like a great cosmic organ. And that's the secret of understanding Bruckner's music, because he was an organist. He was a great organist, maybe the greatest organist since Bach. And he played in St. Florian Cathedral and improvised, and people came from far and wide to hear him improvise. It was one of the greatest things. And he studied and studied and studied music for years. And then when he applied for the conservatoire in Vienna, the director of the conservatoire wrote in his diary, today we were examined by a new student called Bruckner. So he was he may be the greatest musical mind that Europe had. And his music is complex, and there's so much going on if you pay attention. And as I say, if you look at the pipes in the organ in the back there, none of them ever take a bow. It's not personal the way that Mahler is personal. It's sound made, as it were, in the organ. So that's the sound behind this music. Now, I'm going to play you a phrase which many of you know. It's two horns, a tremolando, and fragments of a musical idea. And many of you know that's the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. You know that it ends. <laughs> with that figure. Now listen to this. Bruckner eighth. Tremolando, two horns, and fragments of a melodic idea. It's the same idea. It's the same rhythm. He took that rhythm from Beethoven, and I call it the Beethoven 9 rhythm. And the opening of the piece is majestic and mysterious, and each one of these rhythmic figures can be used. If you hear da-da, or you hear da-da, da-da, or you hear da-da-da-da, each one of those elements can be used for the composition. And so you'll be listening for those elements as they come throughout the first movement. And then there's the Bruckner rhythm. Now, the Bruckner rhythm is like a fingerprint of Bruckner's music, and it is two notes and three notes following. So da, 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 da. That's the, th the theme. And when you get to the B theme, that's the second theme, what you hear is It's actually an octave higher. Should we do it an octave higher? Can also be the other way around. But that's an essential idea throughout Bruckner's uh, music. And now comes the third theme, because Bruckner always had three themes, not only a first theme and a second theme, but also a third theme. And the third theme is uh, in the horn. It's usually a simple theme. And in this case, it's It's a very simple theme. Maybe you would even sing it so you get it into your, into your bloodstream together. Now, I'm you continue to sing that, and I'm going to play what the strings are playing at the same time. And I'm in six, and you're in four. So good luck. Are you ready? Here we go. Are you ready? Here we go. And that's 
That's the idea. So, dum bum bum, bim bum bum, bi da da, and to to. So, those are the three themes. And those are actually all the themes he needs. Now, I want to tell you about the Bruckner crescendo. Everybody knows about the Beethoven crescendo, and even, uh, even he knows about it because I gave him the fifth symphony to play in his limousine. So he's about, be careful, because I got caught for speeding once listening to that recording, and, and I was going at 109 miles an hour, and the policeman did not appreciate that I said it was the tempo of my performance. <laughs> but those crescendos, you know, they get louder and louder and louder. And the thing about Bruckner is that he does more than Beethoven. He goes further. And in fact, I heard a lovely story that, that uh, Bruckner said that when he goes to heaven, which he knew he would, uh, he would, the first thing he would do was seek out Beethoven and apologize for doing more than he did. And he didn't mean that immodestly. He, of course, considered Beethoven the god. But he, he just did more. And so there's a passage in which the violins play, let me see if I can get the pedal, this figure. Um, where are we? Here we go. The, the violins play, sorry. And then they're answered in the horn. And then da dee da da dee. And then again, tee da dee da da. And again, and you notice it goes up and up. And if you, everybody notices the violins, but if you listen to the basses, what they're doing is they're rising up note by note by note by note. They start on a G flat and go up and up and up and up for 18 notes, one after another, until it finally explodes into a kind of triumphant explosion of E flat major. Of course, you don't care about E flat major, but you understand that it's a, it's a related key to C minor. I wonder whether the fish people know that. So, but here's, so what happens is this tremendous sense of exaltation. The trumpets are blaring with a fantastic fanfare, and it invites us to look upwards, to look to the cosmos. This is not drawing room music. This is not, uh, you know, the, the disappointed housewives, or what's that the, the program called? The, the you know, the, the, what was it? Said? You, you, what? Desperate housewives, yeah, no, this is not, absolutely not. This, this is Milton rather than Jane Austen, if you know what I mean. This is, this is, this is uh, contemplating our place in the universe, and he's really inviting us to do that. And what a space in which to do it. Look at the ceiling. I mean, it's just, it's just overwhelming. Now, the question is, is it too long, this build-up? And I say, no, it isn't. It's perfect. Now, sometimes these building blocks, and they are like blocks, go to silence, and there's a pause. And there's a reason for this, because in St. Florian Cathedral, where he played the organ, the resonance is seven seconds from the organ to the back. So it takes that long for the sound to disappear and come back again. And so I believe that's why he had these big pauses. He didn't write it for a church, he wrote it for a concert hall. In fact, he wrote it for this concert hall, for the perfect acoustic. But the bloom on that sound happens in the spaces and the silence. But sometimes he writes a transition. Now, you remember I told you about the bass rising for 18 notes? Well, when it gets to the top of the 18 notes, it's on this chord. <laughs> about that is that's a B flat in the bottom and we call that a 6-4 chord because it's not a resolution this would be a resolution that would be a resolution but this is not resolved right so it has to resolve and what he does he's got to reach E flat the tonic and so he takes little fragments of the Beethoven ninth baba bibi in the flute and in the cellos, and little fragments. And then he gets this one. And finally, and he resolves it. Oh, 
And you'll feel that sense of relief when the horn resolves that. It's the same feeling you have when you drive home after a long day and you turn off the key in your car and you go, ah, oh, I'm home. So trust your feelings if that's what you're feeling. And so he prolongs it, but he does something that no other composer does. Once having reached E flat major, you think, okay, we've arrived at E flat major, now let's do something else. No, not Bruckner. He says, it took us so long to get here, let's really enjoy it. And so he prolongs it even more. So there's a horn solo, a beautiful horn, French horn solo, and then an oboe solo, and then a tenor, uh, you know, one of the Wagner tubas. And you, you can tell the difference between a Wagner tuba and a horn. Wow, that's fa And then the oboe again. And the, the horn does it in E flat major. And then in E flat minor. And then finally the oboe. And now starts the development. So it's the elongation, the beauty. Now all of that, that transition, takes about three minutes. When I was at the Grammys, because you know my uh, Bruckner Five was uh, nominated for a Grammy, so I was there, and uh, I met one of the pop singers, and he said, how long is your song? <laughs> so I said, oh, about 84 minutes. He said, oh, mine's three minutes. <laughs> so you see, we're on a different time scale here. So now, how does Bruckner keep our attention? That's the question. And it's partly the beauty, the sheer beauty of it. If you just enjoy the sound of the instruments and the beauty of the harmony and also the variety of what's going on. It's amazing different things he creates. And the playing of the instruments, the sheer mastery of those te uh, tenor tubers and the bass tuba and the flute and the just incredible uh, playing. And also the story of the keys. Now, I can't go into that now, but um, when my Bruckner Fifth came out, I went into that in great detail. What happens in the story of the keys? And, and I'm going to do more work on that on the website soon. But for the time, I have to go on. And I have to tell you that much depends on the conductor because in the conductor's hands is the way the thing unfolds in rhythm and in timing. And I have here a very precious object. This is uh, a score which my father owned when he was a young soldier in the German army in the First World War. And it's signed here as a birthday present from his mother saying, uh, it says exactly, mit uh, herzlichen Grüße, with deeply felt uh, greetings on your birthday in the trenches. And he was serving on the Russian front, and he studied this, he read it. And in this score are all sorts of instructions from a student of, uh, of Bruckner about moving with the tempo and holding and all sorts of instructions about the way this piece can be played. and. That's the way we're playing it, because I have the score. Nobody else has the score, you see. No, that's not quite true, but at least I, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, there are two traditions, essentially, of Bruckner interpretation. One is rather steady and simply moves forward as the composer writes in the score that is printed. But in this score, what emerges is something much more emotional and much more intense and exciting. And that's the tradition we're following. I find the other rather sterile by comparison. If you want to experience that, Furtwängler, who was conducting also when my father was a young boy in Berlin, he was conducting every week. That's the way they played it. And we're going to re re relive that experience here. So now, quickly, overall, there are four movements. The whole thing lasts approximately 84 minutes. And there's no clapping at all until the end. Okay, you won't want to clap after the first movement. You might be tempted to clap after the second, don't. And the third movement is impossible. It ends so quietly and sadly. But when the fourth movement ends, then let it loose. 
Each movement is in sonata form. Now that means there's an exposition with three themes. You know the three themes already. A development uh, and each movement has one overwhelming climax in it. And uh, the, in the first movement, you know the three themes. You remember ba ba, da da, da da da, that theme, the Beethoven theme, and then da 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 di, and then do di do do. Those are the three themes. Then comes the development, and during the development, a great climax builds, and it builds and it builds. And I would suggest watch the timpani player in the background as he builds and builds and builds. And finally, when he reaches the climax, an amazing thing happens. The basses and the trombones play the Beethoven theme. Da-da! Da-dum! Ba-bum! Ba-ba-ba-ba! Elongated. And at the same time, the, uh, the strings and the winds play the B theme. Da, 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 da. And they come together, an incredible crash of beauty. Oh, my God. I mean, this is really uh, phenomenal. It happens three times, three times. Each one is more. The first one will amaze you. The second one will astonish you. And the third one will overwhelm you. And then you will understand why it takes Bruckner 53 bars to recover from that climax. It's like coming down from a mountain. It has tremendous hypnotic power. And it turns out that that moment is the recapitulation, although we might not realize it, because it's not like a Beethoven uh, um, recapitulation, which is built. <laughs> We all know, ah, we're home. It's not like that at all. We think, are we still in the, in the, in the development? But eventually you hear, and you say, oh, we're in the, we're in the uh, recapitulation. And that's where we are. So that, now then comes the second theme, the B theme, pretty much the same as before, and the C theme, pretty much the same as before, because Bruckner had faith in predictability. So there are changes, and it's good to notice them, but it's not really vital. Now comes the final build-up, and the final build-up is a terrifying thing. And it builds to a climax which, over which he wrote the words Todes Verkundingen, meaning the announcement of death. And this is a remorseless experience. He takes the Beethoven 9 rhythm, da da, da da, da da, da da, da as loud as possible on the trumpets, no, uh, taking no prisoners, and the uh, there's no melody, it's just the rhythm itself, and it's absolutely terrifying. And the end of that is cataclysmic. And if you feel terrified, you should, and you will. And then there's a final chilling collapse, wisps of Beethoven ninth rhythm uh, in the strings, and it ends like the Coriolan overture of Beethoven dying out. And in fact, that was the only piece that Beethoven wrote that end tra ended tragically, and it's like a clock ticking. And in fact, Bruckner said it was like a death watch. And it was the most frightening music he had ever imagined. And it, again, it is terrifying. Beethoven does things over and over, and Bruckner does things over and over and over and over. And finally, you may think it's too much, but I think it creates a human tragedy which we cannot resist in its power. And as you check in with yourself at the end of that movement, see how you feel. See what mood he has brought you to. Now comes the second movement. The second movement is very simple in effect. It's an A, B, A. That means a scherzo, fast movement, and then a slow, gentle movement, a trio, and then it comes back and plays the scherzo again. It has tremendous energy. It's a powerful theme. Da, 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 di, da, 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 di, da, da, di, da, with an accompaniment thing. 
a very fast tremolando in the, in the violins. It's the best view of the German character that you can find. It's beautiful, it's open, it's tremendous fun. The tuba player in the background is having a fantastic time. And then we go to a place we haven't been so far, A flat major, a key that we haven't touched at all in the entire symphony so far. It's like going to another place, another land. And there we find the trio, and it's a whole movement, a short movement, but it has three themes and a development and a recapitulation, and something amazing happens towards the end of it. Suddenly, harps enter, three harps enter and take us maybe to heaven, but it is so beautiful. And you might ask yourself, is this the unmusical ravings of a half-wit? No, I think you'll think it's some of the most beautiful music you've ever heard in your life. And then back to the scherzo. Now that's 14 minutes. So the first movement is 15 minutes, second minute is 14 minutes. How on earth do we get to 84 minutes? Well, I'll tell you. The third movement is very long very, very long, and its theme is love, love in all its manifestations. It's the longest slow movement, um, nearly 30, movement, 30 minutes. It opens up in D flat major, another key we have not explored. Now you may think, but how will I know? I don't know whether you'll know, but when you hear that opening of D major in the ba, um, ba, 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 um, ba, 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 that's one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, that rhythm of Bruckner. You may say, yes, it does feel unfamiliar, and it feels like a heartthrob, like a deep, serene breathing. And then comes a theme in the violins, very simple. <laughs> And then another, th another time. <laughs> and then a whole lot of falling scales, falling scales, each arc ending with the harps. And that's what it comes to an end. And then he does it again, just does the whole thing again. And uh, it reminds me of a lovely story of an American who went to Europe and uh, an Austrian took him to a concert. It was Bruckner. And when the American came out, he said, it's awfully long, isn't it? And the man said, I'm so sorry, I forgot. In Europe, we love music. <laughs> so there's lots of that in this music, but I don't think you'll be wishing it to end. And then comes the B theme, and the B theme is full of tenderness and love in the cellos, beautiful cellos. Oh, that's such a beautiful theme, full of tenderness and warmth and romantic love. And then comes a passage with the Wagner tubas that I played already, do you remember? And then there's a little insert, very interesting. You might notice it. Instead of being in four, the whole piece is in four, there's a little insert in three. And it's very short, and it seems to be a conversation. Bill Carrigan, my dear friend, who, who knows more about this, he has th uh, 500 co copies of uh, recordings of this piece at home and knows it. He's here. He came to hear our performance. He says he thinks it's a co conversation between Bruckner and a young woman he fancied called Marie, and the, she is a little resistant, and he's urging her to reconsider. And it's not bad to know that, but. It's good to remember that this movement is about love, and there's a sense of love permeating it all. And then there are two themes, the cello theme, which I just told you, and the original love theme, and these themes are being developed together. This is happening in the Beethoven Ninth Slow Movement and in Mahler Fourth Slow Movement, which we're rehearsing with the youth orchestra for performance here in, later on in the month. It's the same idea, A, B, A, B, A. That's how it, and then it goes back to the beginning again with the heart throb, and you'll hear that pulsing rhythm, and it gets more intense and more complex, and it reaches a big climax, but it's not the climax, not to be confused. And then the B theme in the cellos, more complex. How much can your brain take in? And then comes that famous passage that I already played to you of the... Of the <laughs> 
da da. You remember that with the Wagner tubas, and then that OMG passage with the whole orchestra sounding like an organ, and then a tender, lovely passage uh, in the violins, the saddest moment in all of Bruckner, a sadness moment in which Bruckner seems completely alone as he was throughout his life. And then when you hear this figure, in the violas, you hear that figure in the violas with this accompaniment. When you hear that, you know that this is the beginning of the biggest climb you'll ever hear. Now, this is like climbing a huge mountain. And you say, are we there? Are we there? And do you remember, Dennis, I told you about this in the car, and this was the bit where you got really excited. You said, I want to be there. I said, this was like climbing a huge mountain. You think you're there, but it isn't there. And then you go up some more, and you go up some more, and finally you reach the top. Now, a lot of conductors make a cut or two in that music, thinking the audience won't be able to take it. But not us. We... <laughs> so we finally get to the top, and the top is overwhelming. And there is a cymbal crash. You won't miss it. The cymbal player's been sitting the entire evening waiting to play. So if your neighbor has d d dropped off, give him a big nudge for the cymbal crowd, because it is overwhelming. And I'll tell you something very amazing. Uh, we say, oh my God, a lot. We say it a lot, but we don't really mean it. Bruckner does. When Bruckner says, oh my God, he really meant it, and that's what he was describing. He was a devout religious Catholic, and he was humble in the face of majesty. The two symbol crashes have different chords. The first one is a 6-4 chord. I can't believe that I'm actually telling you that. But a 6-4 chord is a chord that needs resolution. And the second one with the big sim with the big uh, a cymbal crash is a tonic chord. There's a huge harp flourish, three harps. Bruckner asks for three harps. I've never heard it done with three harps. I've heard one and I've heard two, I've never heard three. But three is what we have, Bruckner asks, we give. And now comes the end. The end is extremely moving. Horns sing the sad violin theme, you know, da, ya, da. And then the Wagner tubas take over, and the violins add little sad snippets of the falling scale theme, which has been throughout the movement, until at the end, there's a whole falling scale all the way down. And when you reach that low D flat, there's a profound silence that settles over the audience wherever you are. And you might check in with yourself how you feel at that moment. The quiet, nobody wants that quiet to end. And now comes the finale, and I just have a few moments to tell you about the finale, but you know what? You don't really need to know any more than you already know in order to follow, because you know the language. It's in sonata form. He said, it's the most important movement I ever wrote. It's the most important of my life. You know how to listen. Trust your feelings. That's the secret for this music. There's a first theme, a B theme, a C theme, a development, a recapitulation, and an incredible coda. The first theme is too uh, noble, too, too grand for me to even play, but you will recognize it and you will experience it. The second theme, very beautiful theme, <laughs> I 
I'm sorry, this little pathetic piano is, it doesn't do justice, but when you hear it with the orchestra, it's so beautiful. The third theme is this one. Sorry, I'm in the wrong key all the time. Rather square in German. Those are the three themes. And there's incredible invention. Someday I'll take you through it, Dennis, and explain it all. But for now, I only have two things to tell you, two last things. And this is really important. The beginning accompaniment of the last movement is a series of grace notes, like that. And it is always played too fast, always played too fast. Even in my previous performances, I played it too fast. The thing is that, um, incidentally, if you're interested, there's a wonderful article by Bill Carrigan in the musical, uh, Boston Musical Intelligentsia about this very issue. It described a festive scene that Bruckner was very attracted by. Three emperors, the three emperors of Austria, Germany, and Russia met to create peace in Europe. And it was an equestrian event, and he wanted to create the sound and the feeling of galloping horses. And apparently, galloping horses gallop at 69, and that is the tempo of the last movement. But nobody takes any notice. People play it much too fast, which means you can't hear the galloping horses. Of course, in those days, everybody would have recognized the sound of galloping horses, right? So. Uh, the, you will never have heard this piece played at 69. It's never, as far as we know, even in the 500 recordings that Bill uh, Carrigan has, none of them do it. They all do it faster. And so if we do it right and the tempo is 69 and the second theme is only a little slower, the whole thing is in one gesture and makes sense and coherence that otherwise it never does. The other thing I want to tell you about is the coda. You will recognize it. First of all, you will feel it coming, I'm quite sure. You'll get a feeling this piece is about to come to an end and then you'll hear this figure in the violins. And that is the beginning of the final build-up. And what happens at the end, in the final build-up, is that he takes all the themes which he's played so far, from the first movement, the second movement, the third movement, and the fourth movement, and he combines them together. And in the final 13 bars, majestic, intricate, glorious passage that it is, he brings us to a place which we cannot reach any other way than through the journey of the whole Bruckner's Eighth. It's a moment of such glory and such fulfillment that we cannot resist it. For Bruckner, it is a gift from God. He is telling us that this is what it means for humanity to be fully expressed. The sense of exaltation, majesty, humility and joy that we feel at the end of the Eighth Symphony is what our lives on earth are for. Bruckner is depicting in music with utmost clarity spiritual truths of which he absolutely is sure. There's a huge struggle in life. We need courage and we need faith in the face of despair and in times of confusion. We need this music more than ever. It provides us with solace, with consolation, and with joy. We love this music, and we hope that you will love it too. Thank you.